Ah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I may have to ask Adam to start my video for me. Uh, th these are the pitfalls of... Oh, there we go. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> good reaction times. There's always one little thing that we get wrong, unfortunately, but never mind. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Bennett. I'm the research manager at the Royal Armouries, and it's my very great pleasure to, to be with you today. Welcome to the latest talk in our winter lecture series. If you're not familiar with the Royal Armouries, we are the UK's national collection of arms and armour. And this year marks the 25th anniversary of our Leeds site, which we, in which we house the bulk of our collections in a purpose-built facility on the south bank of the River Eyre, which is hopefully not suffering too much from the storms at the minute. However, this is only one of our three sites, which includes our historic home at the Tower of London and a Victorian fortification outside Portsmouth, where we hold much of our artillery collection. All three sites are now open, but if you're not able to visit, we also have an extensive programme of online content, including blogs, features and the online catalogue, as well as talks and online events such as this one. Whatever you're interested in, you'll find more details on our website, which is royalarmories.org. Our winter lecture series has taken us from the Dark Ages to the 60s and from Japan to the Wirral, and today takes us in particular to Northeast England. Today's talk is the last one we've got formally scheduled at the moment. I'm just negotiating some of the details with the speaker on AI and autonomous weapons. And the medieval military archery talk looks like it's going to be a standalone over summer. That one's intended to be something a little bit special, so do keep an eye out for it. Over the summer, we'll also hold our summer lecture series, which features contributions from some of the up and coming researchers in the field of arms and armour. For details of any and all of our events, uh, keep an eye on our website or follow us on Eventbrite to stay up to date. For now, you will, as always, you will have opportunities to ask questions to the speaker after your talk. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can type your question in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. If you're watching via Zoom, you'll find a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen where you can type questions. And as always, although we can't get through all of them, uh, we will get through as many as we can. So with the necessary preparation out of the way, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, which is Dr. Michael Reeve. Uh, Dr. Reeve earned his doctorate at Hull in 2019 and has lectured at various uh, a number of universities in the UK. Uh, you can now find him at Bishop Grotest University. Uh, his research deals with civilian, civilian and military resilience during modern war, looking at topics such as the way that tobacco was used as a stiffening agent for soldiers and civilians alike. Today's talk, which ties into Dr. Reeve's latest book, covers how communities responded to a new use of existing weapons of war, the bombardment of civilians. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Michael Reeve. Uh, thanks, Mark, for that introduction. I'll just uh, share my slides. Um, where are they? Here we go. Okay, so you should be able to see them nice and clearly, hopefully. Um, okay, yeah, thanks, Mark, for your introduction. Thanks uh, for having me as part of your, your roster of talks for the winter um, series. Let me just check the settings on this, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone uh, that's here to see me talk today. Um, so I've called my talk uh, Safety First, but a great deal besides civil defence in the First World War. Um, and I, I really hope you enjoy it. So I'll, I'll launch straight into it now. So we often think of the First World War as this, um, you know, thoroughly modern total war. It mobilised the human and material resources of entire societies in Europe and across the globe. And in the process, the footing of economies was shifted to support the logistics of the front line, and both rural and urban environments were transformed by the mechanised destruction wrought by artillery and entrenchment, becoming war landscapes. The conflicts also saw a thorough blurring of the generally accepted boundaries between the conventional theatre of war the battlefield, epitomised by the so-called moonscapes, as some scholars have put it, of the Western Front, and the home front, as towns and cities across Britain were attacked by naval vessels, airships and aeroplanes. Rather than an aberration arising from the attrition of the trenches, such methods express the logic of modern industrialised war. 
In the face of international laws agreed by European states during the 19th century, civilians were now effectively combatants, forced by the circumstances of hostile military actions to treat the urban landscape like a battlefield. So while the fields of Flanders and Verdun were reduced to a slough of mud, craters and splintered trees, the home front saw both monumental and vernacular architecture scarred or reduced to rubble, first by battleships firing from offshore and then by Zeppelin airships and aeroplanes. In Britain, according to official figures, 1,570 people were killed in naval and air raids during the First World War. And out of that total, about 96% were civilians. Prior to the Gotha aeroplane bomber raids of June 1917, some of the most destructive raids upon Britain occurred on the northeast coast of England. 16th of December 1914, so just before Christmas, saw a naval raid by a group of German battle, uh, German battle cruisers upon three towns on this part of the coast, Scarborough, Whitby, and the Hartlepools, as they were known, the two towns being Old Hartlepool and West Hartlepool. They didn't become one town until the 1960s. In Hull, further down the coast, Zeppelin airships dropped bombs on factories, docks, and ordinary homes. Um, and these areas really comprise my main case studies in the talk today, but I am going to talk a little bit about Leeds, uh, my adopted uh, home city now. I am originally from Hull. Um, and unfortunately, Leeds wasn't severely affected by Zeppelin raids, which is obviously a good thing, but it didn't mean that enemy aircraft didn't come close or that people weren't concerned and that they didn't discuss the prospect of raids in the city. Indeed, when warnings had been given of an imminent raid on the coast, residents in Leeds were expected to be prepared for the worst. And I'll comment on this a little bit later in the lecture. So on the 16th of December 1914, as I said before, uh, in little over an hour, 157 people, mostly civilians, were killed by naval shells and more than 500 were injured in this raid on Whitby, Scarborough and Hartlepool. While the threat of German invasion was still accepted as a possibility by the Admiralty, neither the Royal Navy or the Army were properly prepared for this eventuality. Indeed, while pre-war defence planning accounted for the quote-unquote vulnerable points of industrial Hartlepool, neither Scarborough or Whitby were perceived as possessing any installations of interest to a hostile force. This is because they were both to differing degrees, largely sedate seaside resorts. Following the raid, the government admitted that, owing to the unfortified status of these towns, they had been completely defenceless at the time of the attack. So as such, as the historian Susan R. Grazel notes, Hartlepool and Scarborough became watchwords for German aggression and provided the first wave of what became iconic images of attacks on civil spaces. Moreover, the recent experience of Belgium and parts of Northern France under German bombardment and occupation were used as parallels with bomb damaged Whitby and Scarborough in order to brand the event as an atrocity. As a contemporary pictorial account put it, the attack, and this is a quote, the attack had no military value and its only result has been to brace the nation's nerve and stimulate recruiting. And as a Hartlepool commentator put it, quote, after Louvain, vis termont, excuse my uh, terrible accent, uh, airshot after the Hartlepools, Scarborough and Whitby, the world must make answer. And the attack, much like the, the war more broadly, had a very material effect on the local economy, uh, which was reliant on the seasonal holiday trade. So in places like Scarborough, Scarborough particularly, of course, the seasonal holiday trade was all important. So being exposed to the North Sea and to the seaborne passage of the enemy was, of course, not good for business. Indeed, competing seaside resorts on the northwest coast in the comparative shelter of the Irish Sea, such as Morecambe, took advantage of this. An advertisement in the Sheffield Independent in early, 19, um, early August, sorry, 1917, stated, 
Um, safety first, but a great deal besides. Morecambe in these days of war can claim its shores are peaceful, that they are not in the areas which the raiders by sea and land disturb, and that the surroundings of the always popular holiday resort are as charming as ever. Another advert, this time in the Yorkshire Post, claimed Morecambe to be um, safe, sheltered and sunny. And you can see this one um, just there on the right. The West Coast Health Resort, protected from air raids and bombardment by its natural position on the beautiful Morecambe Bay. Adverts for Scarborough in exactly the same issue made no mention of safety or of the war in any way, probably for obvious reasons. Air raids consisting of explosive and incendiary shells dropped by Zeppelin airships killed 57 and injured 151 people in the industrial port of Hull between June 1915 and August 1918. If naval and aerial attacks on the northeast coast are taken together, taking official numbers at face value, they formed 12% of the national total of attacks. And within this area, 66% of the civilian deaths took place during the raid of the 16th of December 1914 alone. So that earlier raid that I talked about, the naval raid, shouldered a lot of the burden. And then Hull was, you know, coming up a close second. The sustained threat of bombardment led to the development of early forms of civil defence, years before it would be given this name. These measures were primarily developed by local and regional civic and police authorities in the framework of national emergency legislation. And that legislation was the Defence of the Realm Act, known as DORA, and its associated regulations, the Defence of the Realm Regulations, the DRR. And these were passed in the first days of the conflict. From the outset, this legal framework blended the language of public safety and national defence in order to empower the centre, the state, particularly the Secretary of State, to deal with the pressures of war on an industrial scale. So rather than a clearly elaborated programme, DORA was, as um, some scholars have um, put it, a process of experimentation under exceptional measures, it was emergency measures. While some have seen these efforts as impulsive and lacking foresight, I would argue that this framework both aided and disabled central government, conferring powers upon a dynamic consortium of governmental and military forces, often with a firmly regional and local remit. Within what was effectively an amorphous coalition of civil and military bodies, known as the Authorised Competent Military Authority, or the ACMA, ACMA, the traditional military authorities were primarily responsible for the stationing of home defence forces and the provision of anti-aircraft guns and defence installations, so the material stuff, the military stuff, of course. In the latter case, efforts on the East Coast saw the shoring up of pre-existing coastal forts and gun batteries and the gradual construction of new ones in addition to post-bombardment measures on land. And rather than a top-down system, as we might expect, these responses mobilised civilians, encouraged them to, encouraging them to take part in maintaining their family's safety through adherence to certain procedures and behaviours. So this primarily military home defence saw a significant military militarisation of coastal urban civilian spaces. In Scarborough, a well-known seaside resort, trenches were dug into the beach and barbed wire roadblocks were installed in streets running perpendicular to the seafront. And this was to prevent a potential invading force from getting any further into the town. As a contemporary observer noted, these installations gave the town the appearance of a war landscape, like a battlefield, much like the Western Front. And you can see, I won't read all of this out, but you can see on the, sli on the slide just here, there's yards of bar barbed wire have, have been crossed and recrossed, making an effectual and spiky barricade about six feet high across the roads. And you, you can see a, a, an image um, of some of this um, on the slide as well. Then in the principal thoroughfares, they replaced massive sandbag 
barricades and um, you've got further sandbags there uh, and there are holes left at regular intervals for the guns in case the Germans land and are rash enough to do a little sightseeing. Quite a nice, uh, quite a nice reference to the you know the seaside status of the town there right at the end. And this militarization of the town's civilian spaces, hitherto of course associated with domestic residence and seasonal entertainment, was achieved despite it not having the status of a defended port in government defence plans, unlike Hartlepool and Hull, which had plans related to defence, military defence. And what I'm doing here is there's a stating the difference between home defence as it was put by contemporaries and civil defence, um, which, which I'll go into a little bit more um, shortly. Home defence is more the kind of physical installations. Um, and as you can see in Scarborough, there were plenty of them. Defensive trenches were built into beaches in Hartlepool as well, primarily to provide cover for docking facilities, while pre-existing coastal guns and batteries were improved. In Hull, following a significant Zeppelin raid on the 6th of June, 1915, um, the, whole, the, the local urban environment was militarised too, through the presence of soldiers and anti-aircraft guns, though its impact was less severe than in Hartlepool owing to its defended status. It was um, in, so in Scarborough, in Scarborough, it was much more of a shock because, it, you know, this, this kind of, um, these kind of installations were not expected in the same way. The months that followed these attacks from sea and air were also accompanied by the improvised and often experimental activities of local authority officials. With the suspension of local democracy, um, there were no um, elections. City and borough engineers, town clerks and chief constables became some of the main players in the development of early civil defence programmes, as we might call them. So a poster printed um, following the December 1914 attack on Hartlepool encouraged residents to remain in the lower part of their houses or cellars, as practically no casualties occurred in those who did so during the bombardment. You can see that just here. The experience of material destruction and loss of life led to this almost immediate response, which was both a call for calm and a tacit acknowledgement that a follow-up bombardment and even maybe an invasion was possible. And this was something that was printed locally, devised locally. In Whitby, instructions written by a local press correspondent recommended that civilians with homes within range of a hostile fleet prepare a safety room, as it was put, preferably a lower room or basement with suitable fire exits. Failing this, um, and this is a quote from the documents, a pick, hammer and other implements should be stored there so that a way may be hacked out if necessary. Civilians were then prompted to keep vessels filled with water in each room in case of fire and retain a store of food, warm clothing, candles and matches. These instructions were, as the writer made clear, in lieu of any official instructions. Therefore, um, and this is a, another quote, the public must do a little hard think thinking for itself. And out of this, we may evolve a better plan than official advice could provide. So this is more akin to the civil defence side. So versus home defence as the physical um, kind of installations, civil defence, I'll say here is more of these behaviours, these kind of preparations um, that we might think of when we think of people huddling in uh, the London Underground or in bomb shelters during the Second World War. And beyond the issuing of public safety information, the main civil defence method adopted across the region was the restriction of public lighting. And this remained a consistent policy throughout the war, as the threat of Zeppelin raids was most likely at night and military defensive resources could not be provided without a substantial delay. As such, the Chief of Northern Command, which is the, the uh, military command responsible for the North of England, the Chief um, stated in June 1915 that 
the best passive protection against zeppelins is darkness, as you can see just there. And that's from uh, documents held uh, at the National Archives. Initially, this rule was underlined as particularly important for coastal areas, as it was feared that lights could be shown seaward, thereby attracting enemy vessels. Ironically, such a civil defence measure drawn up to safeguard public safety and defence of the realm, as the language of Dora put it, entailed its own public safety issues, particularly as there was a lessened visibility in urban streets and an increased likelihood of petty crime without the civilising presence of light. And of course, light was associated in the late Victorian and Edwardian periods with you know, guarding against crime, uh, with progress and so on. Furthermore, though air raid alarms or buzzers, as they were called, often using a kind of steam to make a buzzer sound, were developed across the region. They often caused a great deal of confusion and disquiet, particularly as so many were sounded falsely. In Hull particularly, this did not prevent civilians from calling for audible early warning systems as late as summer 1917, due to the city being in the danger zone, the danger zone as it was put. Um, and a, a civilian correspondent to the local newspaper, to the Hull Daily Mail, uh, referred to the city as the danger zone. Um, yes, and it's particularly this, uh, the issue of, of, of early warning systems was, was fraught in the early, uh, in the months following the December 1914 bombardment, particularly because as these experiments were going on, um, a lot of people, uh, particularly in Hull um, and Scarborough, um, it was hard to tell the difference between the early warning buzzer and the sound of ships that were in dock uh, and so on. So people got quite confused. Um, so that added to people's stress. Uh, eventually, they did get on top of it. There was cooperation between Hull and Scarborough in devising these experimental systems. Um, and they do seem to have been eventually quite effective. Um, but there is this, as you might say about all of these efforts during this war, there was a degree of experimentation uh, is, of course, to be noted. Despite Fortunately, uh, never being badly affected by Zeppelin raids, Leeds was apparently targeted by raiders. The early forms of civil defence that I've commented on for the coastal towns in, my, uh, in the northeast, the case studies I've looked at, they were employed just as readily in Leeds, obviously inland. So to take just one report from April 1915, Leeds was plunged into darkness following reports that a Zeppelin was moving south after visiting Durham. Uh, and official statistics from the War Office um, do state that there was a raid in that region on the 14th of April, and that resulted in the injuries of a, a woman and a child. A report in the Lancashire Evening Post on the following day stated that, and you can see this on the slide, at once in accordance with arrangements made some time ago, the whole of the lights in the city were extinguished. There was not the slightest panic but the cutting off of the light occasioned some confusion. The performances at the local theatres and music halls were curtailed, but the audiences were quickly got away without suspicion that anything worse than the failure of the electric current had occurred. A pre-arranged code uh, signal summoning all special constables to duty was thrown on the cinema screen at the various places of amusement and proved very effective a large number presenting themselves at the town hall. Uh, presumably that means to have some kind of shelter. In some cases, it was the threat to the um, coast that raised the alarm in the city, leading some to fall foul of Dora regulations. So people were aware of things that were happening on the coast. People sprung to ac action as far inland as Leeds. But this meant that some people um, fell foul of the regulations. So on the 18th of April 1916, um, John William Foster, who was the caretaker at this time of the Queen Street Wesleyan Chapel in Morley, uh, which is now the, for Leeds people, uh, the Central Methodist Church on, on Wesley Street. Um, but Mr. Foster was charged with not having extinguished two electric lamps in the chapel yard 
after the warning of an East Coast raid had been disseminated. Foster was eventually fined five, five pounds, five shillings and sixpence, including costs, which is over 300 pounds in today's money, managed to work out. And this is all the more surprising, given the fact that earlier in the month, Zeppelins had apparently tried to raid in or around Leeds. The French writer Charles Stignon, writing in the magazine Current History in May 1917, stated that a raid had been attempted on Whitby, Hull and Leeds on the 5th and the 8th of April 1916. But I looked into this a little bit more and it might not have been entirely as it seemed. The Leeds Mercury of the 8th of April 1916 provides additional information. Apparently, after getting hold of an official German report of the raid attempt on the Northeast and West Yorkshire. However, the writer is scathing in their condemnation of Germany for spreading false reports of successful attacks on industrial cities in England. And it's worth quoting at length um, and note the hint of sarcasm. Um, and I'll read this, it is worth quoting at length, as I say. So the report chronicles the destruction of large ironworks near Whitby and extensive buildings and blast furnaces in some place not specified, the placing out of action of a battery of guns um, north of Hull and attacks upon factories at Leeds and environs and a number of railway stations in the district where very good effects were observed. In face of this report, we feel impelled at last to join the chorus of those who condemn the government for its suppression of news likely to be of interest to the public. For we remained quietly at work in our publishing office all night on Wednesday night and went home with the milk in the morning, all unconscious of the nearness of the foe or of the bombs which had been wrecking factories and railway stations all around us. What is still worse is that nobody else knew anything about it either. The police sent around no order to put the lights out and the military authorities slept peacefully at their posts, utterly unconscious of the devastation going on around them. And on Thursday morning, the people got up and went about their business with no knowledge whatever of the destruction that had gone on throughout the night. What is more, they know nothing about it even yet. The simple the truth of the matter is, of course, that nothing of the sort happened at all. The Zepps have not been within many miles of Leeds, and the whole story is exactly on a par with that circulated by the Germans very early in the war, in which vivid descriptions were given of how Leeds and many other towns were merely heaps of burning wreckage. The whole thing affords a striking illustration of the extremities to which the German authorities are forced in order to keep up the spirits of their own people and to maintain the prestige in the eyes of neutrals. So for this writer, this fake news uh, was evidence that the enemy was on the back foot. Its people were low on morale and the end was nigh. And for me, the episode is evidence of how very real the threat was and how real it felt. Even when raids were apparently imminent on the coast, there was a requirement for people as far inland as Leeds to be prepared for any eventuality. Hence, I think the strong feelings, even when a raid did not occur, so though I've not got as much time in today's talk to go into much more detail, I can't go into every single detail of the kind of multi-level development of home and civil defence schemes before and during the First World War. Nonetheless, it's clear that notions of public safety, including safety from bombs, fire and invasion, were at the heart of these experimental efforts. Indeed, implicit in all was a belief that anxiety could be converted into a manageable fear and that such tangible risks entailed by bombardment could be combated through particular activities and behaviours. Being prepared for an enemy attack at first imagined and then experienced directly made it appear that civilians could actively preempt bomb damage and destruction, encouraging them to be resilient in uncertain and dangerous times. This was especially pertinent in coastal areas and in ports, such as the ones I've covered, as they were not only particularly susceptible to actual bombardments, but were imbued with cultural significance as links in a broader imperial network, or part of the stage for the playing out of intracontinental 
rivalries. And as, of, as we've seen, the experiences of civilians under bombardment produced startling parallels with the experience of soldiers overseas and the experience of civilians in other beleaguered places across Europe. And this was a motif that will continue to have relevance during the interwar period, as civil defence measures prior to 1939 were developed in earnest. And I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you. Not all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. It's all this aerial bombardment stuff like that is such a, a, a phenomenon we associate so closely with the Second World War that it's great to have like a really detailed look at its, its precursors. Before we dive into the questions, I'll just uh, very quickly apologise to those people who are having trouble uh, accessing through Zoom. So some of you will hopefully have found your way over to YouTube and we'll send the link out. So uh, if you struggle to get into Zoom and you're watching again, uh, yeah, apologies for that, but at least you get to, uh, to experience the talk. So, uh, Mike, I might quiz you if it's all right on some of the precursors to this sort of stuff, because there's a lot of sort of late Victorian fiction about the UK being invaded, you know, the Battle of Dorking, stuff like that. And there's quite a bit of civilian bombardment in there. So are there any sort of formal government plans for things like this to happen and how they might, uh, you know, uh, uh, protect against it? Yeah, I mean, um, there's 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 kind of uh, planning at a government level mm -hmm. um, for the eventuality of invasion um, from the kind of late nineteenth century, and mm -hmm. the enemy at court, of course, is imagined to be France mm -hmm. at that time. But then, from the start of the twentieth century, we we really see this switch to the 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 focus being Germany because mm -hmm. they are this emerging power, an emerging um, imperial power they've got a growing navy they never match um the royal navy um you know which is the great pride um of the top brass as well as many it's in popular culture it's a very strong plank of a british national identity and um, yeah so we have this which germany is the as the emerging power and um yeah there's, there's planning uh, around uh, shoring up defenses um so existing uh, kind of gun batteries mm -hmm. on in coastal areas. You've got um, discussions, in fact, a lot of squabbles going on between the War Office, which looks after the Army, and the Admiralty, which looks after the Navy, mm -hmm. about how much money each of them can have. You have these ideas that are called the kind of Blue Water School, which is that we didn't need um, troops on the ground in Britain to repel an invasion, because as long as the Royal Navy has got enough money and enough resources. There's no need for any of that. Mm -hmm. So there's this big debate for on the run-up to what, of course, becomes the First World War around um, resources, around where the owner should be on. Should it be on, on a kind of territorial force mm -hmm. um, and arming, you know, kind of um, active citizens to defend themselves from invasion, or should it be about shoring up the Navy? And ultimately, the the Navy wins out um, and it is a big part of, of the war effort that's often not talked about. Um, but yeah, so in short, there, there was planning going on, um, but uh, it's still clear that the um, people didn't quite believe that there would be bombardments and they didn't, they certainly didn't believe there'd be invasion, uh, but they didn't even believe that, bombardments would happen so that's why it was such a terrific shock when Hartlepool, Scarborough and Whitby were quite badly affected um, in those early months of the war um, in that first year of the war. Well, from memory there's a there's a perception at least among certain people that you know Germany's a land of culture and Goethe and Schiller and all that sort of stuff they couldn't possibly do anything like bombard towns and kill civilians presumably it changes quite rapidly uh, once this happens. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, you get the the idea of the German Hun, you know, mm -hmm. using that kind of very inflammatory language. But, um, I mean, as a few historians have, have kind of written, um, a lot of, uh, I mean, the uh, kind of, um, a lot of British intellectuals kind of revered German culture, uh, mm -hmm. you know, music and literature. And this, of course, has to stop uh, when the war starts. But really right up until the cusp of the war, there was a lot of respect for kind of German 
um, German kind of cultural life and, and its outputs. Um, and that's why I think if you, remember, if you remember back to that slide uh, that was commenting on, I might be able to just go briefly back to it. Um, it this, why this um, author is it's marked so clearly in this paper that it's a French author. Um, it's because in that context, there's this very, uh, it's just, there's this need to write that, which seems strange to us now that you would need to, you would need to write that. Um, yeah, there's a, um, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say now, but yeah, um, there's a, obviously Germany has to become a bogeyman when it's the enemy. Um, but it's, it's a real, it's a real about face, really, I would say. In many ways. We had a question from uh, Harrison Oxley, which was sort of about the, the the practicality. So once these towns needed to be, be defended, was it trained soldiers who were being stationed there being kept from the Western Front, or was it civilian volunteers, the kind of people who couldn't go out and uh, go off and fight? Well, in places like Hartlepool, they, they had um, a, re a regiment stationed there looking after the the uh, the, the battery there. The Huff was the, was the main one, and they had a couple of others. Um, so, in general, places that had um, staffed um, facilities had soldiers um, stationed there. Um, the other main responsibility for kind of policing and managing the emergency regulations was the police and particularly the special constabulary. So the volunteers um, that came forward um, and so the special, the special constabulary, we were familiar with it now as kind of like, you know, voluntary part-time police officers. And they do a couple of, a couple of shifts a month. Um, but initially going back into the, the, the mists of time, the special constabulary, constabulary was, was raised at times of kind of national peril mm -hmm. and particularly social upheaval um, uh, when kind of workers were getting a, li a little bit too uppity um, or there were food riots, they would get well-meaning kind of uh, middle-class gents to don a truncheon and uh, kind of go about their work. Uh, and in 1914, there's a new Act of Parliament that re-establishes the Special Constabulary to manage civilian populations during the war. And what ends up happening with the specials is that they become not really a force associated with crime and crime prevention or crime control, but with um, occasionally putting out fires, with knocking on people's windows and telling them to put lights out. Mm -hmm. So a little bit like ARP wardens in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, they end up being stretcher bearers, um, helping people when they've been hit by, when their houses have been hit by incendiaries and, and bombs uh, in attacks. And of course, the other plank of all of this effort is civilians themselves. They are given all of this information to prepare rooms in order to, to uh, kind of shelter from the bombs of it, like this chap you can see on the slide. Um, incidentally, this image is, was produced before there'd been any substantial attacks. So this is kind of preemptive imaginings of Mm -hmm. the things that people might do but yeah, the other yeah the other plank of all of it is civilians being in you know encouraged to adopt certain behaviors um maybe a little bit like what we've had to do in the pandemic mm -hmm. to uh, be prepared to be vigilant to not pick up bits of um shrapnel in the street which is something the Hartlepool authorities had to tell people because people kept taking them as souvenirs um that yeah that kind of thing so you've got uh, places that were deemed legitimate targets like Hartlepool and Hull because they had industrial facilities and docks and factories. They had soldiers stationed there. They, of course, had special constabulary involved as well. Um, but the places like Scarborough, um, Whitby, they were caught off guard initially. Then there was this rush to militarise them. Um, so you end up with, it's a little bit messy, but you've got different actors from different levels of government and civil society kind of having to work together um, in a kind of jigsaw puzzle of, of dealing with the situation, I suppose is a bit of a convoluted way to answer it, but I think it got there in the end. Yeah, no, no. Do the British have anything to go on at all? So, I, you know, 
Co Copenhagen was bombarded fairly comprehensively in 1805 by the Royal Navy. But I'm struggling to come up with anything in the sort of the, the, the 19th or indeed the early 20th century that might have prepared them. Is there anything like in those, you know, those early 20th century wars in the Balkans where they could potentially have looked at it and, and learned lessons about what to do in, in respect of civil defence? They don't seem to have, have, have learned any substantial lessons apart from some kind of fairly inflammatory stuff when people thought, so when, when there's the bombardment of Hartlepool, mm -hmm. the initial response is to talk about how this is the first time anyone has kind of died on British soil for like, you know, two centuries and th this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this sense of it being a great um, kind of atrocity. Um, the, 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 the kind of war office and admiralty planners, as I was saying, are kind of more concerned with fighting out with who should get the resources. Um, I mean, I think fundamentally at this time, um, it's we, we, really, it's like the thick of the kind of naval triumphalism mm -hmm. um, and making sure the Royal Navy can stop any invading force getting anywhere close to, to the islands. Um, that seems to be where they're at. And that's, yeah, it's it's a strange thing that happens where they're caught off guard with the bombardments. Mm. Um, but then it it's it's propaganda gold, you know, when it does happen and it becomes this great um, motif for recruiting men to go to the front. You can have a kind of revenge narrative, um, so a little bit like the Avenge the Lusitania stuff that comes when the Lusitania is sunk in 1915. You've got, you know, kind of Avenge Scarborough, remember Scarborough as a way to get people to join the colours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Presumably the, the Admiralty can't be too upset that the Germans have spent million millions of pounds on these battleships and battle cruisers and all they're doing is, you know, shelling Hartlepool and Scarborough and Hull. It's, it's probably... You know, phenomenally expensive shells as well, high explosive stuff, and all, all this money is just going into to blowing up a few houses. Mm. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's. I mean, the interesting thing about the whole that whole incident is that ger the German intelligence seemed to suggest that there was a good reason to to shell all of those places, um, and of course, this wasn't seen by people in Scarborough, or particularly Scarborough, because this is this kind of. Uh, famous um, seaside resort, which is associated at this time with kind of with luxury and the kind of upper crust, really. It's increasingly got working class, a working class, solidly working class area, but it's still got this kind of, um, in the popular imagination, it's still this kind of posh uh, seaside town. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, I think I've lost my way a little bit. Remind me of what your question was. Uh, so the the, the question was on, uh, presumably the Admiralty is quite happy for the Germans to spend all this oh, money. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so, I mean, the Germans do think that, they're, that their actions are illegitimate, mm -hmm. ostensibly. Um, and, you know, there's, because there, uh, at, at one point there was a barracks in Scarborough in the, behind the castle walls, but there, was, there were no men there when the bombardment mm -hmm. happened. Um, there were kind of ornamental guns on the front. I mean, as you often see in seaside places, like guns <laughs> with a kind, guns with a kind of cork plunged into the into the into the muzzle. Um, and but this was taken to you know to as uh, legitimise the the actions, I suppose. And um, but yeah, people were having none of that uh, in England, of course. Roughly, what range are we looking at for the the distance between? Thinking specifically about the naval bombardments, but the the ships and the uh, you know how far were they from the town when they were shelling? Oh, I can't remember the exact uh, distance, but you um, you could kind of if you were stood at Hartlepool Headland or mm -hmm. stood at Scarborough Castle. So if anyone's been to more people are more likely to have been to Scarborough, <laughs> I imagine. Um, you stood, stand in the grounds of Scarborough Castle. You could kind of see you'd see the ships. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit closer to you than the horizon. There would, so you'd be able to see the ships. I mean, if it, it was really foggy, but once the fog had cleared, you'd be able, you'd, you could, you'd be able to see the ships. Um, they weren't, yeah, they weren't too far out. And the, 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 the first shells that hit Hartlepool hit 
um, did hit around the, the the Huff battery, which is on in Old Hartlepool on the headline. Um, but then the, you you can you had kind of arcing fire that did end up going quite far inland and hit a lot of houses in West Hartlepool, which is primarily once you get past the West Dock, is, is really just loads of working class residential areas. And um, so that's why more people died in West Hartlepool, um, the the newer part, um, the newer town uh, that was built after the railway kind of develops. Um, yeah, because of this arcing fire. Um, and yeah, similar similar case in Scarborough where you've got, you've got shots going really far inland and hitting um, kind of big, um, you know, big kind of middle class um, housing um, further inland, as well as hitting the famous examples like the Grand Hotel mm-hmm. uh, and the like. So, yeah, uh, I've not been very exact there because I can't remember the figures, but yeah, their, their aiming isn't, you'd say their, their aim wasn't exactly perfect, but um, they did hit some of the target, some of what were, to to their mind, legitimate targets. But then this arcing fire did hit completely defenceless civilians as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you might their aim wasn't great, but they were certainly more effective than the Zeppelins, which tended to have to drop their pl- payload a lot of the time in the sea or in fields and they get blown off course when the weather was bad. Um, so, yeah, before the Zeppelins, the, the naval... I mean, that's why the, this this first big... Na- one of the first big naval raids was uh, more deadly than some of the later Zeppelin raids. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, I mean, g- you know, given... Without, you know, a comparable naval gun, you're not going to be able to defend against battle cruisers, despite all those trenches and all that barbed wire put up. You know, it, was that primarily for popular morale and was there any sort of awareness of this at the time yeah i mean i think there was a sense that um you know it, people would feel more comfortable with mm-hmm. with the being men stationed there and places like hull had historic um forts and batteries mm-hmm. um you know at the so you've got you've got batteries at either side of the um, the mouth of the Humber, Hartlepool has got several batteries. Um, what's interesting about them is the money that is used to shore them up um, is not really put to good use um, in terms of getting the work done quickly, bad weather stops, um, a lot of the work going on, particularly around Hull, and it doesn't get finished until really either towards the end or after the war which is completely, completely moot by that point. Um, and yeah, I think there's a sense, yeah, if you, there were things you could do that would make people feel more comfortable. And really in Scarborough, when they, when they send, I mean, after that bombardment, they sent troops into the town. The Leeds rifles were, were in York and they were, they were sent down to, to Scarborough. They're kind of mustered in the town. Uh, they put up all of these facilities, all these kind of like, they put up these entanglements, built trenches. This was really about impelling an, an invading force, you know, because the, this bombardment had happened. The idea was that, oh, well, there could be an invasion now. We better, we better spring, spring to action. I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone would, would have really believed that the kind of guns they had in the batteries would really have been able to repel naval vessels. Mm-hmm. It was, it was really. The, the, the Royal Navy was supposed to have stopped them getting there in the first place. But then um, the, what, the discussions they had at the high level of the Navy was that, well, if they do come, we'll, we'll be able to chase them away, mm-hmm. which is a, a little bit mealy-mouthed, really, after uh, quite a deadly ra- raid happens. Um, but, yeah, again, it goes back to that blue water thesis of, like, belief in the Navy to, to, to be this kind of uh, defence force in the sea and that if an invading force does land, then there'll be some men there in the places that need it. Um, but yeah, it didn't it didn't necessarily pan out as planned. And as as Grumpy Cato on YouTube asks, were there plans of, for an actual invasion of Britain by the Germans? I know we've probably all heard of Operation Sea Line and the 1940s stuff, but is there anything comparable for for World War One that you're aware of? Not not that I'm aware of. I mean, I've not been in the German sources, but. Um, there wasn't a kind of a clear plan as far as I know about, you know, a, a, an invasion. There was more of a, a fear in Britain that an invasion might happen. 
I would say, uh, rather than in any kind of uh, cogent plan. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Uh, and a, a technical question from Harrison Oxley. Now, I've got an idea about this if, if you don't want to feel this, so feel free to pass if you choose. But were there anti-aircraft guns during World War I? And if so, what were they and were they effective at all? Uh, I'm aware of the, the, the anti-aircraft the anti guns in Hull that were installed at various points following the Zeppelin raid. So Hull was caught quite off guard in the city. Um, so they had these kind of, you did have guns right on the coast at the mouth of the Humber, at the, at the, at the, at the, the Hull side and then at the Lincolnshire side. Um, but of course, when Zeppelin start coming over in earnest in kind of 1915, um, you've not got a lot of anti-aircraft defence in the city. Um, they do end up, I mean, you've got the kind of um, the local military force, um, the local military top brass, constantly writing to the war office saying, can we have more guns? And it's often, they're not forthcoming. Um, they, when they eventually get them, kind of 19, I think they get, they get some more in 1916 some, and then some again in 1917, but don't quote me on that. They, get, they, get, they have some mobile guns that they put on the back of, of wagons to, to, to be responsive to where Zeppelins are in the city, which, is, which was obviously a very good idea. Um, and uh, in terms of the, what, what the guns were, I'm not, I'm not great on the technical side of what the guns were. For me, it was just important that they actually got some guns. I don't know if Mark can add anything to that. Um, I was going to say, yes, this, this is the beautiful synergy of these kind of events. So if, if you're really, really curious on the technical side of things, inquiries at uh, armories.org.uk is probably your best bet and it'll come through. Because I, I think from memory, we've got at least one down at Fort Nelson, but I couldn't swear to it. But a lot of the time there, you sort of, uh, you quick firing guns from uh, naval ships that originally intended to defend against torpedo boats and destroyers and stuff like that. And then they just, you know, they, they angle them up. From I think they also experiment with a 13 pounder, which is a horse artillery gun, because obviously there's not a lot of horse artillery being used on the Western Front at this point. But yeah, have a word with the, the inquiries team, because they may, may if, you know, if you're very curious, they may be able to fill that in uh, a little bit more. Uh, and I had another question uh, from uh, a Russian name, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know enough Cyrillic to, to pronounce it, but just in terms of how did the Zeppelin get there? How did it not get hit? So I presume it's, you know, it, it coming overseas, but if, you know, where are they coming from? So uh, from what I remember, you had ships coming over from the kind of principal ports mm -hmm. in Germany. So you've got uh, like Willem, Willem Schaven, um is is where some of them come from. So they've just they've just got to flo <laughs> float as deftly as they can across the North Sea. Um, and this was, yeah, this did frighten contemporaries because um, it wasn't really that far, you know, to get across the North Sea. Uh, the, so the, the issue with Zeppelins is they would, actually, they would often make it to the British Isles, but they wouldn't necessarily always get near to where they were, were intending to hit. So they would be blown off course and then occasionally have to be expected to still drop their payload. So then this would be dropped like in a field somewhere and then not really having any, have any point whatsoever. Um, sometimes they would be blown and that would be advantageous and they'd be able to, to drop their bombs on somewhere that was more of a target. Um, but they, they did manage to make it over, but uh, the weather wasn't always great for them. I mean, in Hull, the police produced a, a map of the lunar cycle that then the en encouraged officers to use, which meant that like on on very on nights when the moon was very bright, that it would be expected that um, uh, that um, I suppose it would be expected that zeppelins wouldn't hit on really light nights. They would want it to be on nights where it was particularly dark, so they could kind of sneak in. Um, of course. But then the other, the flip side of that is, if the moon was very bright, you'd be able to see targets more effectively. Um, but of course, we had in place um, defense of the realm regulations around lighting um, and dock traffic and, and noise in general, which was supposed to guard against 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 that. If, if the zeppelin did make it to where it was, but yeah, to, to summarize my um, rambling response, um, 
yeah, the Zeppelins did manage to make it, but they weren't always particularly great at aiming and they did get blown off course. I was going to say, of all the jobs in the, the First World War, there are some terrible ones, but being in a big uh, hy- helium hydrogen filled balloon over the North Sea in the dead of winter, in the yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure it's one that I would have wanted to do. Hmm. I mean, there, there were exper- there were British experiments with using using airships as well, um, kind of in the first decade of the 20th century, but they don't seem to have really gone for it. But they did experiment with it, and they were quite excited with the idea of it. But it didn't it didn't really seem to it really seem to come off. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. But I was going to say. Uh, Mike, you've got all your social media contact details there. So if anyone has any further questions specifically on this side of thing of social defence of the First World War, I assume it's absolutely fine for them to get in touch and, and let you know. Yeah, there's bound to be things I've left out or questions that people think of later. Yeah, so no problem at all. I was going to say, if, if there's anyone who wasn't able to get on Zoom who is uh, watching again and does have a burning question that they're desperate to ask you, um, I, I assume that's okay. And... Likewise for us, uh, inquiries at armories.org.uk, that will get you in touch with one of our curators. Any technical questions about weaponry, something like that, just let us know and we'll be more than happy to uh, to answer that. But that does bring us to the end of uh, today's talk. So thank you very much to Mike for giving today's lecture. Uh, thank you to Adam for producing the event behind the scenes and to the audience for taking time out of your day to attend. Uh, Yes, so as I said, we don't have anything specific planned for the, uh, at least not booked in, so I can't direct you to uh, the website, unfortunately, to sign up, but do keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on our social media and there will be future events to come. Uh, But for now, thank you again for your time today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Uh, So Mike, you'll have to uh, stop sharing your screen so I can share the end slides. There we go, thank you. Yes, we we will see you soon.